In this moment, I will be talking about glycolysis, which is a very important pathway because it is relevant in two major uh, realms of metabolism, namely one, carbohydrate metabolism, and two, cellular respiration, be it aerobic or anaerobic. And uh, the way that I will discuss this is first, focusing on the individual steps. So this is a little more technical or a little more uh, uh, mechanistic. But then after which, I will proceed to the other aspects of glycolysis, particularly the way it is regulated and the way we correlate it with the other pathways of cell respiration. So without further ado, before we even go to the first step, let us think about the word glycolysis. Now, this literally means the breakdown of sugar. Um, of course, glyco as a prefix does not actually mean glu glucose only. It could actually refer to other sugars. Indeed, uh, other sugars like galactose or fructose can enter the glycolytic pathway, though I, I, I have decided not to include that in this discussion because they will enter in their own different ways. But since this is the most common one, we will just limit ourselves with glucose. So in step one, uh, just imagine first that this is a cytosolic. This will be even more significant as you uh, watch the next pathways after this. So imagine that we have a glucose molecule in the cytosol. The first step in glycolysis is the conversion of glucose to glucose 6-phosphate via the enzyme hexokinase. Of course, the only thing that happened was the addition of a phosphate group at number 6, which should make sense because if you remember... Uh, the way we name enzymes, an enzyme that ends in kinase is supposed to transfer phosphate. However, if we say transfer, that means that the reason why glucose got the phosphate is that we're, we're supposed to assume this phosphate came from another source. And the source of that phosphate is actually ATP. So maybe uh, if, you could, if we could try to imagine this in, uh, in more detail, it's as if hexokinase's job was to get one of the three phosphates from adenosine triphosphate, give it to glucose such that glucose now becomes uh, phosphate-containing. And then, of course, since we took one phosphate away from ATP, after the reaction, it now becomes ADP. Only two phosphates remain. Um, this is a very important concept because this, this idea of, uh, uh, of tracking things where they go, uh, the fact that if something was added, it must have come from something, or if something was lost, it must have went somewhere, is crucial for the other steps that I will discuss in the latter part. Next, in step number two, we have glucose 6-phosphate being converted by phosphoglucoisomerase into fructose 6-phosphate. And just based on the name of the enzyme, what really happened was that glucose gets converted to its isomer fructose with the phosphate still remaining at carbon number 6. Now, that would actually remind you that glucose and fructose are not so far from each other. Both of them are hexoses. Remember that they, they both contain 6 carbons. And the only difference with them is actually their functional group glucose just to refresh you on this, is an aldose, fructose is a ketose. Actually, if you try to get the structure of glucose and then replace its aldehyde group with a ketone moiety, it suddenly becomes fructose. So, that's what happens in step 2. A molecule of G6P becomes a molecule of X, F6P. Next, in step 3, we have the enzyme phosphofructokinase, oftentimes abbreviated as PFK, converting fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Of course, as you could see here, the only thing that changed was that from only one phosphate at number 6, we added an extra one at carbon number 1. So the prefix bis means that I have two of this. The abbreviation for this molecule is usually FBP. And uh, now, if you even trace the first three steps, from glucose to FBP, we should first ask, or we can ask, what happened? Well, um, I added two phosphate molecules. And why is that? Because, as you can see, we actually sacrificed or used two molecules of ATP. Once again, we assume that adding this means we have gotten this from something else. Next, in step 4, FBP is converted by alteolase into two products, 
And the reason is because there was actually a splitting or a cleaving process or a cleavage step. Wherein you could imagine, um, notice I'm not anymore drawing the structures because, because if I did, there would be uh, too much detail for us to cover in one slide. So just imagine that we have a molecule of fructose and we know that fructose contains six carbons. And then we split it uh, into two products with the equal number of carbons. So if I divide the 6 by 2, of course, I would have, of course, two uh, products wherein each of those products um, would have three carbons. So the name of those three carbon products are actually as follows. One of them is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate or GAP. And then the other one, a different one, is dihydroxyacetone phosphate or DHAP. But still, that uh, means that despite their difference in name, they are both three carbon compounds. And we actually consider them both as sugars, just like fructose. So if fructose is a hexose, we could consider GAP and DHAP as trioses. Uh, well, trioses with a phosphate. No wonder if you look at the enzyme name for step number five, the name is triose phosphate isomerase. The fact that we have here triose phosphate reflects the nature that, well, these two are indeed trioses with a phosphate group, and isomerase means that they are, well, isomers. And uh, actually, this is somehow parallel to glucose and fructose. Like, if you can think of glucose as the aldehyde and fructose as the ketone, well, look at this. We have, once again, an aldehyde and then a ketone. So, uh, yeah, they can interconvert into one another thanks to this enzyme. And this is very important for a reason that I will explain later. Now, in order to proceed with step number six, we need to carry on using glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate or GAP. So in step number six, we have the enzyme GAP dehydrogenase, converting glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Just to go ahead of the explanation already, um, I cannot uh, explain in full detail why there was the addition of an extra phosphate, but this is an indirect result of the other things that will happen. Um, the 3 phospho is uh, actually the same thing here, but the extra phosphate at number 1 is added as a side effect of the other uh, thing that I want to explain, which is the fact that if you notice the name change, it goes from glyceraldehyde, to glycerate. Now, in organic chemistry, usually the suffix "-ate", is reserved for carboxylates. So, like, um, carboxylic acids are COOH, right? So, carboxylates are COO-, minus. so it's just like the ionized form. Therefore, uh, even if I replace the suffix "-ate", with ic acid, I'm just uh, changing it from ionized to the unionized state, but I'm actually referring to the same molecule. So, uh, things with 8 at the end, you could replace with the suffix ic acid and you will be still referring to the same compound. So in that case, I could call phosphoglycerate as phosphoglyceric acid, or for example, pyruvate as pyruvic acid, and even in the next discussions, lactate can also be called lactic acid, citrate, citric acid, and so on. But now the question is, if we add an aldehyde at the start, and then after the reaction it became a carboxylic acid, what? reaction really happened. Now, if you remember, the conversion of an aldehyde to a carboxylic acid is actually an oxidation process, right? And the thing here is that if you notice the name of the enzyme, it actually alludes to the oxidation step because if you remember, oxidation can also mean dehydrogenation or the removal of hydrogens. However, just to continue that story, we do know that every oxidation process should always be accompanied by a reduction process. That's why uh, we, we sometimes even call them as half steps, right? So, or in, in one, uh, if you want to word it in another uh, way, every time that we take away some hydrogen from something, it must be, the hydrogen must be given to someone else. So, where do we give this hydrogen that we took away? And the answer is NAD. We give the hydrogen to NAD such that NAD, after giving it the hydrogen we took away from this process, becomes NADH. So, technically speaking, NAD to NADH counts as reduction. <laughs>
which would make sense um, now that this is the oxidation and this is the reduction that should come with this oxidation process. Okay? And this is important because we should remember that based on my introduction uh, uh, clip, NADH is convertible to ATP uh, later on in cell respiration. Next, from 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, phosphoglycerate kinase will convert it into 3-phosphoglycerate. So you notice the number 1 has been cut off, so the, uh, it's like it's, it's taken away, and the bis is, is already gone. In other words, that must have meant that from here to here, we have removed that phosphate at number 1. Okay, And of course, uh, just to follow what I was saying before, in this case, since we lost something, it might be a worthwhile question to ask where that phosphate went. And the phosphate actually went to a molecule of ADP, so adding another phosphate to this one would make it a molecule of ATP, which is pretty much the opposite of step 1 and step 3, right? Because in step 1, the substrate was the one you give the phosphate to, and then the ATP is the one you take the phosphate away from. In this case, it's now the opposite. It's the substrate which gives away the phosphate, and the phosphate is now given to ADP. Usually, the reason why this happens is that we assume the substrate in such step is said to be a high-energy compound, so much so that it becomes unstable, that in order to become stable or to release some of its energy, it has to give away its phosphate. This type of reaction is often called substrate-level phosphorylation. Substrate level, because, well, the reaction started with our substrate trying to dissipate its energy, as I have just explained. And phosphorylation is uh, the proper term for a reaction that adds phosphate to something. In this case, uh, uh, we, we add phosphate to ADP, it becomes ATP. Okay? And do note that there are other phosphorylation processes to give us ATP, but I will be dealing with those other methods in the future. Next, in step number 8, we have 3-phosphoglycerate being converted by phosphoglycerate mutase into 2-phosphoglycerate. Notice that the only change that happened is the locant number. And that's the good thing about mutases. This is so convenient because mutases literally just interconvert positional isomers, that is, two compounds that differ only at the locant of a certain substituent, in this case, the locant of the phosphate group. Next, in step number 9, we have enolase, which will convert this molecule into an enol compound, so that's easy to remember. So from enolase, you produce phosphoenol pyruvate. And uh, notice that the phospho here has the white color because that means this phospho is actually the 2-phospho um, here. Okay, so it wasn't gone, it's still there. Okay. And uh, the name glycerate became pyruvate. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot anymore um, distinguish okay, or contrast the structures of the two because I did uh, mention that we will be uh, uh, removing those from this recording. But uh, <coughs> basically, we just uh, kind of rearranged the uh, functional groups here, but the carbon still stays the same. Remember, glyceraldehyde is a trio, so all the way down, we still retain that three carbon count. Then, uh, oh, by the way, phosphoenol pyruvate is often abbreviated as PEP. Um, this is important because we will be seeing PEP for whatever reason in the next pathways. Okay, And then finally, in step 10, we have the enzyme pyruvate kinase converting PEP into pyruvate. So as you can see, the prefix uh, phosphoenol has been you know, cut off. So after cutting that off, the only name of the compound after is pyruvate. Now, of course, since we removed the prefix Phospho, that means we took it out. Of course, it's another uh, good thing to ask, where did this go? And actually, just like 7, the answer is the same. The phosphate went to a molecule of ADP. After we give that phosphate to ADP, it becomes ATP. So actually, just like step 7, we could consider step 10 as another substrate-level phosphorylation reaction. And uh, we could also assume that PEP, just like the 
molecule here above contains high enough energy that pyruvate kinase could utilize that condition to make our ATP here. Okay. Now, um, really, before you, you, you proceed, if you feel like uh, you just wanted to, to, to get familiar with the 10 steps, you could already stop watching this. But if you do know that part of your uh, discussion of glycolysis um, involves other uh, deeper content, uh, content that will allow you to connect glycolysis with the other pathways, then I highly encourage you to carry on. If you've decided to carry on, let's discuss a lot of other things. So, first, one thing that I would like to discuss, okay, is the fact that we started with a hexose, right? This is a six-carbon compound. But why is it that we ended with a three-carbon compound? Of course, uh, that means that uh, we, we, we just didn't discuss something because that three carbons uh, that we are looking for or missing uh, uh, it cannot be just you know um, removed from thin air it can't just vanish and uh, just to answer that question like hey six carbons to three what happened to the other carbons it's simple notice in step number six we carried on discussing g3p or gap but that is just this one Maybe, uh, or maybe some of you would have already noticed this. We didn't discuss this anymore. And the reason why DHAP was not discussed from step 6 to step 10 is that glycolysis, for whatever reason, in the evolution of creatures um, across the board, this DHAP molecule is not anymore allowed to proceed to steps 6 to 10. Now, that doesn't mean that this molecule is like hopeless or something because if you want to utilize this for the next uh, steps of glycolysis, we actually have, as you can see here, the option to convert that DHAP into another molecule of GAP. So think of, think of it this way. So if I have, for example, a molecule of FBP, we split it into a molecule of GAP and DHAP. We know that this molecule has no problem at all because it, this would just carry on to step 6 and 7 and so on. But if, for example, we want to also utilize this for the same reason, we could just assume that this molecule can also be converted using triose phosphate isomerase into, well, what we can say a second molecule of gap. A second one because the first one is the original gap. And so it seems like the second gap is just like a product of the conversion of the original DHAP. Long story short, it's as if, if we start from glucose, we actually have technically two molecules of GAP to use for step 6 to 10. Thus, if we assume that this DHAP will be another molecule of GAP, we have to multiply all of the things we see here at the right side by 2. And so, allow me to do that. That means this one is multiplied by 2, as well as this, as well as this, 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 and even the final product, which is pyruvate. And now, since pyruvate has three carbons multiplied by two, we now have six carbons. So now, it's a more complete story. I start with six carbons. We end with six carbons. So the law of conservation of matter is now conserved. Also, don't forget that we are also supposed to multiply the things here because... Uh, they should always accompany the corresponding amount of the substrate, right? 2 is to 2, 1 is to 1, and so on. Now, with that said, um, that means that I could uh, actually proceed to the next slide, wherein I will shrink all of what you are seeing right here. Yeah, and uh, I retain the fact that we multiply everything at the right side by 2.